Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, proud citizens of vast early America and publishers of the William and Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. To learn more about the William and Mary Quarterly and how you can enjoy some of the best scholarship on the vast world of early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 137 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. George Washington was an accomplished man. He served as a delegate to the First and Second Continental Congresses, as commander in chief of the Continental Army, as the president of the Constitutional Convention, and as the first president of the United States. And on top of all that, he was also a savvy businessman who speculated in land and ran a successful plantation. Now, George Washington and his wife Martha were also slaveholders. By the time George died in December 1799, 317 enslaved people lived at Mount Vernon. These enslaved men and women performed all the agricultural and domestic labor the Washingtons needed. And throughout their lives, some of these enslaved men and women would accompany the Washingtons on their travels and stays away from Mount Vernon. For example, in 1789, the Washingtons took seven slaves, five men and two women, to New York City, where they served them in their new roles as a first family. A 16-year-old girl named Ona Judge was one of the enslaved women who accompanied the Washingtons. Today, Erica Dunbar, a professor of Black American Studies and History at the University of Delaware and author of Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave, Ona Judge, leads us through the early American life of Ona Judge. Now, as we explore Ona's fascinating life, Erica reveals who Ona Judge was and how she came to be one of the Washington's enslaved women what George and Martha Washington were like as slaveholders, and the story of Ona Judge, who ran away and lived the life of a fugitive slave. But first, in case you missed last week's exciting news, Ben Franklin's World and I have a new home at the Omohundro Institute. I'm really excited about my new position as the OI's Digital Projects Editor, and about being part of all the great work the Institute does to support early American historical scholarship. Plus, I'm thrilled to have them on board as a full partner on this podcast. Now, what this lasting partnership means is long-term support for Ben Franklin's world, more great interviews with scholars who work on all different aspects of early American history, and more multi-part series with narrative-style episodes. Plus, it means that once a month, I get to travel down to Williamsburg, Virginia, to work with its talented team of historians and professionals, all with the goal of creating more great episodes and historical resources for you. For more information about the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and all the great and fascinating work that they do, visit vastearlyamerica.com. Okay, are you ready to explore the fascinating life of Ona Judge? Let's go meet our expert historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a professor of Black American Studies and History at the University of Delaware. She researches the African-American experience with a particular focus on the experience of African-American women, and she's the author of two books, A Fragile Freedom, African-American Women in the Antebellum City, and, most recently, Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave, Ona Judge. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Erica Dunbar. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Erica, we're excited you're here because... Ona Judge sounds like a really fascinating woman, and we're anxious to learn more about her. Yeah, she is. I think she's one of the most incredible women I've ever come across in the archives. So I'm I'm thrilled to be able to talk about her, her life, and how her story speaks to life in 18th and 19th century America. Now, Ona Judge was an African-American slave woman and a member of George and Martha Washington's household. Erica... Before we dive deep into the details of Ona's life, would you start by helping us out with some context? Would you tell us what the Washingtons were like as slaveholders? 
Sure. I think that's an important question. And ultimately, the book, Never Caught, is really the text about enslavement and freedom. And by centering the narrative around an enslaved woman who was born and raised at Mount Vernon, home to Georgia Martha Washington, it really allows us to think about race and labor in 18th and 19th century Virginia in a different way. And while I wanted to be able to talk about enslavement with the Washingtons, I also wanted to be able to tell the story of the founding of the nation through the eyes of the enslaved, and Ona's life allows us to do this. She was born at Mount Vernon sometime around 1773-74. We don't have an exact date, and she was what was called a dower slave. She was considered the property that was passed down to Martha Washington and her heirs after the death of Martha's first husband. So Ona's mother was actually a woman named Betty, who was owned by Martha Washington. She was a talented seamstress, and Ona's father was a white indentured servant. I'm saying all of this to kind of explain what servitude and slavery looked like at Mount Vernon. Both George and Martha Washington were slave owners, and their property was always sort of explained very separately in the records at Mount Vernon. So George Washington inherited slaves at the age of 11, and he continued to purchase them later on and throughout much of his life. Martha Washington also inherited enslaved people. And so when we look at the slave census from Mount Vernon, by the end of George Washington's life in 1799, there were over 317 enslaved people residing at Mount Vernon. Now, not all of them were owned by the Washingtons. So 123 of them were owned by George Washington. 153 were considered dower slaves, were the property of the Custis estate. And then there were a little over 40 who were rented and who had been rented by George Washington and lived and worked at Mount Vernon. And they engaged all of them in every type of work possible, from growing tobacco or rye or corn to doing domestic work like spinning and sewing. I think it's important to note that Mount Vernon was a huge plantation of five working farms with over 8,000 acres in the 18th century. And so these men and women, the over 300 people who were enslaved there, men, women, and children, worked this land and did all of the kinds of labor that was required to keep this kind of massive enterprise moving. In 1789, George Washington became the first president of the United States, and he, Martha, two grandchildren, and seven slaves relocated to the nation's capital in New York City. Erica, I wonder if you would tell us about the seven slaves the Washingtons took to New York City, and what it really meant for these slaves to be selected by the Washingtons to accompany and serve them in New York. Those are great questions, because it actually allows us to think about the different expectations and desires fears of the enslaved who were chosen to go to New York and then later on Philadelphia. So there were seven, as you said, seven men and women, five men, two women. And Ona Judge was one of the women selected to go. You know, I focus a little bit more on the women who were selected. Again, I call Ona a woman, but she was actually only 16 years old when she left Mount Vernon, left her mother and most of her siblings behind that she would go to serve Martha Washington as basically her top slave, the woman who was responsible for the most intimate of responsibilities, helping her bathe, helping her dress, brushing her hair. And she also accompanied her on all of her social calls, which meant Ona became a sort of known entity both in New York and in Philadelphia. Maul, who was a 57-year-old woman, who was the other woman who accompanied the Washington, she was a seamstress, as was Ona. And she was really responsible for the two grandchildren who would journey with the Washingtons to New York and Philadelphia. And Ona, of course, would have stepped in and helped Maul on occasion with the grandchildren. We also believe that Ona slept in one of the bedrooms of the grandchildren, at least in Philadelphia. There were five men who accompanied the Washingtons. And first on the list was William Lee, who more people know about in part because he was sort of Washington's top enslaved valet. He was close to 40 years old when he sort of pushed his way to the front of the line to travel north. And he was someone who had already been 
really limited and disabled by the difficulties of 18th century life and more specifically of being enslaved. He had broken both of his kneecaps. He was really sort of unfit to serve in New York, but his interactions and perhaps we could say relationship with George Washington did allow him this opportunity to go north. He had been north once before and clearly was desirous of going again. Austin was a 28-year-old enslaved man who was a waiter for the Washingtons and actually was Ona Judge's half-brother or sibling. And so in many ways, this was at least a piece of family that came with her to New York and later on to Philadelphia. He was, as I said, older than Ona and served the Washingtons both in New York and Philadelphia and was actually someone who was fairly trusted and respected among the Washingtons. They would give him money to travel back and forth to Virginia when required. And he would sort of take on a position of leadership amongst the waiters. Paris was a postillion. He was a driver for the horses, horse-drawn carriages for the Washingtons. And he, as well as another young man named Giles, was a postillion and would learn the streets of New York and Philadelphia quickly. And the last of the seven was Christopher Shields, and he was actually the nephew of William Lee. So we see these sort of familial relationships play out once again. William Lee, who was the valet and the sort of butler for George Washington. Christopher Shields was young. He was about 16 years old, similar to Ona. And unlike the others, he was most likely literate. And so there was always a concern once this became known that this could be problematic for the Washingtons. Literacy and enslavement did not go hand in hand. So as the Washingtons moved their enslaved men and women to the North, they realized that they would have to be more careful, more cautious about maintaining enslavement in states or commonwealths of Pennsylvania that had already begun to dismantle slavery. You noted that Ona became one of Martha Washington's top and most valued slaves. That seems pretty impressive for a 16-year-old. How did Ona get to that role? We can't say that it was a role that she wanted, but clearly it's something that evolved over time. Like other children at Mount Vernon, enslaved children, around the age of 10, she found herself positioned in the household, in the mansion house. And like her mother, Betty, she became a seamstress and a spinner and started to perform domestic labor, domestic work that the enslaved who worked in the house needed to know. And by the age of 16, she had clearly managed to gain the favor of Martha Washington. We don't know exactly why. We know that clearly Martha Washington had a preference for lighter complected enslaved people, especially those who worked within the household. And this may have helped Ona in her elevation in the household, but I really think it had much more to do with Ona's competency, her ability to be a quick study. And she also was surrounded by her family members who were also trained in domestic work and trained Ona up as well, so that over the course of six years, she managed to become that, as I said, sort of top slave. We don't know if that was something that Ona appreciated or something that left her deeply unhappy, because it clearly forced her separation from her family. Her spot as that top slave forced her to live hundreds of miles away from her mother and the majority of her siblings for many years. Wow, it doesn't sound like Ona had much of a childhood. It sounds like she basically became an adult at a very young age. Yeah, and that's accurate and very similar to the majority of the enslaved, not just at Mount Vernon, but in other farms and homes across the nation that as early as eight, nine, we would see children being given responsibilities to whether it was in the field or in the house or in the stables to help. And if they could help out and it was required at an earlier age, that happened. And so in many ways, what we see with Ona at the age of 10, going up to Mount Vernon to the mansion house, this was very typical of what childhood slavery meant. It was short, 
And it was a moment that undoubtedly came to an end when duties and responsibilities were placed on the shoulders of young people. Do we know what Ona made of New York and how her life in New York serving the Washingtons would have differed from her life serving the Washingtons at Mount Vernon? Yeah, you know, her time in New York, the Washington's time in New York was so brief. That's a moment where we don't know much from Ona, at least from her words, in part because, as I said, it was a brief period and also filled with kind of upheaval. Aside from George Washington becoming the president and this huge transition from having been a private citizen for a while in Virginia and then moving to New York and Martha Washington unwillingly, but of course, moving as well. There was so much to deal with in really that first 18 months that they were in New York, in particular, George Washington's health, which was sort of precarious during that time, that we don't know much about sort of Ona's exact feelings or thoughts about that time. However, we do know from the accounts of others, from other enslaved people who moved from a place like Virginia to New York, that it couldn't have been anything other than startling and somewhat amazing, yet also with the reminder that slavery was still very well intact in New York, with over 20,000 enslaved people and a much smaller sort of number of free Blacks, it was very clear that politicians and those who were in positions of power still used and benefited from slave labor in the ways that she would have seen in Virginia. However, it was a free Black population, as well as life in a city, I think that would have really changed not just Ona's experience, but the experience of all of the seven who traveled from Virginia to New York. And as I said, you know, they would leave New York by the late fall of 1790. And so the majority of Ona's time up north during her enslavement with the Washingtons was actually spent in Philadelphia. As Erica just noted, Ona's time in New York was brief. After about 18 months in New York, the capital of the United States moved to Philadelphia in 1790. Now, in 1780, Pennsylvania passed a gradual emancipation law with the idea that it was going to abolish slavery. Erica, you mentioned this law in passing, and I wonder if you would tell us a bit more about this law and how it complicated the Washington's practice of slavery in the capital city. You know, the Gradual Abolition Act in Pennsylvania, which took effect March 1st of 1780, really sort of set the stage for a different kind of experience for the Washingtons and for the enslaved in Pennsylvania. It also is a moment where we can see the difference between the states of, say, New York and, you know, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was well on the way of dismantling slavery, and this law really began that process. And the law basically stated that if you owned a person, if you were a slaveholder, and that person was born on or after March 1st, 1780, they could only be held in bondage up to 28 years. I say the word only, and that was a long time in the 18th century. But what it signaled was the eventual demise of slavery. And so that by the time Ona arrived in Pennsylvania in 1790, there was a significant number of free Black people, 6,000. Philadelphia had the largest free Black population anywhere in the nation. And really, when she, and at that point, there were nine enslaved men and women who would serve the Washingtons in Philadelphia, so the number moves up a little bit. But those men and women would be in the minority in the city, a city that counted really only 100 or so enslaved people. So the law had done quite a bit to disrupt human bondage in Pennsylvania. And this is problematic for the Washingtons, who had every expectation of maintaining enslavement while they were up north. Another sort of interesting sort of thing to think about, that they had lots of white servants that they used, but they were unwilling to give up the use of enslaved laborers. They preferred them. They wrote that. They said it. However, the law was also problematic for the Washingtons because for non-residents, they found themselves in a position where they could lose their property. And basically, the law stated that if you were a non-resident and you traveled to Pennsylvania and you kept your enslaved people or your property, your human property, in the Commonwealth for more than six months, 
those men and women would be considered sort of fit and able to claim their freedom. So there was really sort of a stopwatch on enslavement for non-residents, and the Washingtons were made aware of this, and they took measures into their own hands to really protect the ability to own slaves in a northern city that had already, for the most part, disowned it. So what kind of measures did the Washingtons take to protect their enslaved property? Yeah, it was actually a fairly complicated slave rotation plan that the Washingtons engineered. George and Martha Washington, in addition to his secretary, Tobias Lear, wrote to one another explaining that they had to move their enslaved men and women out of Pennsylvania every six months, whether it be to Virginia for a summer trip, or if that was too inconvenient across the river to Trenton, New Jersey, it would basically stop the clock on the ability of losing your slave after a six-month residence. So it really was this well sort of thought out plan to circumvent the law. And, you know, I'm clear in that the Washingtons weren't actually breaking the law by doing this, but clearly they were breaking the spirit of that law. And what was very clear was that the Washingtons' slaves knew about this law. They knew they were being rotated. They knew why. And eventually, over time, this would be a sore spot for the Washington, something that they were very vigilant about. And also, it must have been wildly unsettling, traumatic, and confusing for those who were enslaved by the Washingtons under the spotlight of serving perhaps the most powerful and well-known man and woman in the nation, serving as people who were held in human bondage, but also witnessing Black freedom right in front of their eyes. It must have been confusing and frustrating and maddening for all of them. The Washington slave rotation system is really interesting because it doesn't jive at all with what we learned about them in the history books, which is that George and Martha Washington owned slaves, but they were benevolent slaveholders. I mean, George Washington freed his slaves after his death. So Erica, were the Washingtons really benevolent slaveholders? You know, I've been working on the history of slavery and freedom now for over 20 years, and I'm not quite certain I know what a benevolent slaveholder is. I think that We use that phrase, or that phrase has been used to describe people who weren't necessarily extremely violent or punishing in the most demonstrative of ways. I think any kind of enslavement for any person was violent, but I also make the point in the book that enslaved people, you know, they judged who was considered a more violent slaveholder and who was perhaps a little more lenient. So we learn maybe that they were benevolent, but we also know that, you know, this was for the most part a national myth. We know that Washington interacted with or wrote to his estate managers consistently about behavior of the enslaved, and he gave permission for beatings and whippings or the skinning of backs of the men and women who, as he said, needed to be corrected. We also know that Washington, on occasion, sold enslaved people that he felt were extremely difficult to the Caribbean, which was, as we know, especially in the 18th century, that was a death sentence. And so this idea of sort of benevolent slaveholders and mm, the Washingtons or anyone else who would sign off on punishment, on sale, I think this complicates what we've come to know, as I argue, as a sort of national myth. However, I will also say that there were descriptions of the Washingtons written by others in the 18th century, and they are conflicting as well. There were some that argued that George Washington was just indeed a benevolent owner, and there were others who said the opposite. What we know is that men and women who lived at Mount Vernon constantly attempted to run away. And I think that signals more than anything the issue of benevolence and slaveholding, that if men and women were attempting to run away constantly, I think that tells us a little bit about benevolence and what it meant to be enslaved at Mount Vernon. And clearly we know that eventually Ona takes this opportunity to run as well. 
With that backstory in place, let's dig into the drama of Never Caught. Erica, Lynn would like to know what prompted Ona Judge to run away and how she found the courage to do so. You know, I argue in the book that there are a couple of things that sort of all come together that prompt Ona Judge to make this decision to run. She had lived in the North for seven years at the moment that she makes a decision to escape. And there were a couple things that were happening. The first was that George Washington had made the decision not to run for a third term in office. So it became very clear this was not yet in the winter and spring of 1796. It was not yet known by the public, but his family and those who lived within the walls of the president's house certainly knew that he would not run again. And so for the nine enslaved men and women, they understood that this would put an end to their residency in the North. But I think it was really the actions of one of the grandchildren of the Washingtons that forces, at this moment, Ona to make the decision to run. And it was the sudden, unexpected marriage of Eliza Park Custis Law, a granddaughter of Martha Washington, who sort of announced to her grandparents via the Post in February of 1796 that she was marrying. She was marrying a man they didn't know. He was 20 years older than she. He was an Englishman who had spent a good amount of time in India and came to America with two of his three biracial Indian children. So he was a bit of a wild card for the Washingtons, to say the least. And they were surprised and worried about this union, Martha Washington in particular. And she felt that Eliza was not prepared or ready for this marriage. And she made a decision as a grandmother to look out for her granddaughter in really the only way that she could at that moment. And she made the decision to give Ona Judge to Eliza Park Custis basically as a wedding gift. And we know that this information trickles back to Ona. We know that she finds out that at some moment she was going to be bequeathed or given to Eliza. Some said that it would happen upon the death of Martha and George Washington, but Ona knew better. And she had every belief that this would become something that would happen immediately. And she was also very clear that there was no love loss between her and Eliza Park Custis Law, who was really kind of described as a somewhat difficult woman, someone with a bit of a volatile temper. She was about the same age as Ona Judge. And Ona really knew that at that moment that her life would change if sent to live with Eliza. And she sort of knew that she would never have an opportunity to experience life the way she had been living it, clearly in the North, but also never have an opportunity for freedom. And she says this in the interviews that she leaves at the end of her life. And so she makes this decision. It's, I think, the experience of living in the North with a free Black population and knowing that her ownership was going to change these issues prompted Ona to make this decision. And on May 21st, 1796, Ona literally stole herself from the Washingtons as they ate their supper, and she would leave their house in Philadelphia, never to return. Yeah. What about the practicalities of her escape? I mean, how did she escape the Washingtons? Where did she go? And how did the Washingtons react to her escape? You know, her escape, we're fortunate, as I said before, that she left behind interviews that tell us as much as possible about this escape. She says that really it was the free black community of Philadelphia that helped her. She never names names and she can't during her interviews because that would be placing the people who helped her in harm's way as it was a federal crime to assist a fugitive. But she does give us the name of one man, a man by the name of John Bowles, who was the ship captain on a ship named the Nancy. And she says that he is the one that ferried her to freedom. And she gives us his name because he was already deceased and therefore not in harm's way. And really, it's these kinds of clues that gave me as a historian the opportunity to try and piece together what exactly happened. And indeed, John Bowles was in Philadelphia with his ship, the Nancy, in May, and he was back in his home state of New Hampshire by June. And so Ona would board the ship, the Nancy, and make her way to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She says she really didn't know where she was going. She thought Boston or New Hampshire. 
and eventually arrives in Portsmouth and realizes that Portsmouth was the last stop and it would be a place where she would attempt to start her life anew, not as a free person, but as a fugitive. And it's for that reason that I titled the book Never Caught, because it's very important for people to understand that her journey to New Hampshire did not make Ona Judge a free woman. It simply distanced her from her owners, and therefore she was never free. She was simply never caught. And her stay in New Hampshire, at least for the first several years of her time there, would be riddled with attempts of the Washingtons trying desperately, really, to reclaim her. Marcia would like to know what kind of a life Ona made for herself as a fugitive slave living in coastal New Hampshire, and what type of work she was able to find to support herself. You know, those who know about Ona Judge's story, they know the story of perhaps her escape and the fact that she was Georgia Martha Washington's enslaved person, really Martha Washington's. However, she was 22 years old when she escaped the Washingtons, and she would spend close to half of a century away from them. And I think that's a really sort of crucial point to be made, that only a quarter of her life did she spend with the Washingtons. She would be forced for another 50 years to try and find a way to live and to love and to build a family, all while a fugitive. And she does that in the way that countless others did it, not just in New Hampshire, but in states across the North. She lived a very modest life. I don't want to give everything away because I do want people to read the book, but I will say that she was able to build a life for herself, build a family for herself, but was forced always to do it in a way that placed her sort of in the shadows, that she was constantly aware that she was not free. She was a fugitive. And at any moment, she could be taken back into slavery. And not only could she be taken back into slavery, but any family she would have, any children would also be at risk, no matter the status of their father, because slavery followed the apron strings of its women. So any children that Ona Judge would have would eventually be considered fugitives as well. And so she would spend the next half a century finding work as a domestic, washing clothes, doing very difficult kinds of labor, suffering through terribly cold and long New Hampshire winters with relatively little in the way of sort of material or financial support. And yet, even though it was terribly difficult, and this was a life that was filled with uncertainty and fragility, her life was very similar, I would argue, to others who were in a fugitive status or even those who were technically free and forced to live and work in a state that still required freedom papers, that still set curfews for Black people, that Ona's life and never caught helps us to sort of dismantle some of the myths about what the North meant to Black people, free, enslaved, or fugitive, that the life there was extremely fragile, whether you were in Connecticut or New Hampshire, that you could be stolen and taken into slavery, whether you had been enslaved or not. And these are the kinds of challenges that Ona Judge and the small community of Black people in New Hampshire, what they encountered on on an everyday basis, it was uncertainty and a real sort of poverty and harsh sort of standard of living. But I think what's so beautiful about Ona's story is that she tells us that she never regretted it, that her decision to flee and to face the sort of difficulties of life in New Hampshire, that it was all worth it for her. And if she had to do it again, she would. In Never Caught, you detail many ways that the Washingtons attempted to bring Ona back to Virginia. And I wonder if you would give us some insight into just exactly how the Washingtons attempted to reclaim Ona. You know, for the remaining years of the Washingtons' lives, they would pursue Ona Judge. And it was really a combination of depending upon the help and assistance of appointed members of the federal government, the Secretary of the Treasury, a customs collector in New Hampshire, as well as family members, all were used to try and reclaim 
on a judge. So fairly quickly, Ona runs away in May of 1796. The Washingtons know where she is by the end of August of that year. So there's a very short period of time where they actually don't know Ona's whereabouts. And I think perhaps that's one of the most remarkable things about Ona's life was that the Washingtons knew where she was and worked very diligently to try and reclaim her, but to do it in a way that was discreet. And as George Washington wrote, to do it in a way that would not upset the sort of sensibilities of those in New Hampshire who had moved away from the system of bound labor. And again, at this moment, this sort of clandestine and discreet attempts to reclaim her. It's a reminder of one of George Washington's flaws, that he actually was breaking his own fugitive slave law by going after Ona Judge without using the mechanisms in place according to the fugitive slave law that were required, meaning attorneys had to be involved and magistrates and identification of said runaway. These were things that George Washington was very clear he did not want to engage in if necessary. And he also wrote in his letters that, you know, that his wife was very desirous of seeing Ona again. A reminder that this was not just an attempt to reclaim Ona on behalf of George Washington, but that Martha Washington was very involved in this, as to be expected, because Ona was technically the property of Martha and her estate. And so attempting to use a nephew to go up and get her, a customs collector, they tried repeatedly to reclaim her and were rebuffed at each turn by the people of New Hampshire, more specifically, though, by Ona, who stood her ground and basically said, if you want me, you're going to need to come and get me. And this was at a very difficult moment politically for George Washington, who was about to leave office and very mindful of what this could mean for his image. He was interested in leaving office without the scandal of running after an enslaved 22-year-old woman. And so when his attempts were unsuccessful, he walked away briefly from attempting to reclaim her, but would pick that up again as a private citizen. And so we have, really, we have documentation of George Washington attempting to reclaim Ona as late as September of 1799. He would die unexpectedly in December of 1799. So really up until the very end of his life, he was still attempting to reclaim his wife's property. Earlier, you noted that you titled your book Never Caught because Ona always lived as a fugitive slave, that she was just never caught. Did the Washingtons hunt for Ona end with their deaths? I mean, did she ever feel safe and secure in her stolen freedom? That's a great question. You know, I think it's fairly safe to say that Ona's actions tell us what she was thinking. And her actions led her to leave Portsmouth and to head for really the woods in a town called Greenland, right about six, seven miles outside of Portsmouth, where Ona would spend really the rest of her life, almost half a century, in hiding. And so I think that act, the act of moving away from the city of Portsmouth that was still relatively small compared to a New York or a Philadelphia, to live among a small free black community, that tells us that she felt insecure, that she needed to be protected by anonymity, and that it isn't until the end of her life that she felt really that the risk was relatively low to tell her story in a very sort of national way with her interviews in two abolitionist newspapers, the Granite Freeman and the Liberator. So it's very clear that although the Washingtons pass away and Ona is technically therefore not hunted by them, she also knew that she had been, before she left, she was supposed to be the property of Eliza Custis Law, who was alive and well. And therefore, she would always be at risk unless there was a formal emancipation that was offered by the Custis estate. She would always be a fugitive, and she knew this. And for that reason, she remained in hiding for really just about the entirety of her life. In Never Caught, Erica tells a really rich story about Ona Judge and about her life as both an enslaved woman and as a fugitive slave. Erica, would you tell us what it was like to research and write Never Caught? Because you really didn't have a large written record about Ona from Ona to follow and write your book. 
you know, for those of us who do early African American history, in particular women's history, or just early women's history, that we often confront the limitations of the archives. And it takes a sort of special handling, I think, of the materials in the archives to be able to tease out a story like the life of Ona Judge. And I consider myself really fortunate that I had had the opportunity to write A Fragile Freedom prior to Never Caught, which was a book about how Black women became free in the North, in particular in Philadelphia. And so there were moments where I may not have had a document that said, Ona Judge did X this morning, or Ona Judge ate brown bread for breakfast. I may not have that documentation, but I know that a woman named Hannah who was formerly enslaved, ate brown bread for breakfast, and I have a recipe for it. And so I think for those of us who are writing history, if we want to write more inclusive history, that's not simply top-down or based upon the written documents in archives by founding father types, that we do have to think, look, and spend more time in the archives, but also read the documents differently. There are many, many, many Washington biographers, and some of whom have mentioned Ona's story, but it was just that, a sort of story or a chapter in a piece of George Washington's life. And for the kind of work that I do requires a centering of Ona in the story because it allows us to get at larger issues of slavery, of freedom, and of what this period, the early republic, meant not to the men and women who were able to write, who were taught to be literate, and also not to be literate, but to also archive their records, that we can't simply depend upon that work to tell the nation's story. It has to be bigger. It has to be broader. And I feel super fortunate that that I was trained in a way and had sort of done the necessary work to be able to confront a sort of more challenging story of Ona Judge. And fortunately, as I said before, there was enough in the way of documentation from Ona, from George Washington, and from others to really tell this story and offer a more sort of nuanced understanding of what life looked like in the early days of the nation. When you say we need to read sources differently to get at stories like Ona Judges, I wonder if you could give us an example of what you mean. I mean, how might you read a historical source differently from another scholar? I think reading the letters of George Washington as he wrote to the customs collector in New Hampshire, who he was attempting to have him help pull Ona back into enslavement, You know, these were fascinating letters that have been mentioned before in other collected essays, but no one really sort of spent time thinking about how these letters and George Washington's attempt at reclaiming Ona was a violation of the law. These weren't simple letters to a customs collector asking for help. These were plans and considerations to break a law that he had actually signed into existence. So I think coming at documents such as his letters from the viewpoint of the person he was pursuing helps. So, okay, what would Ona Judge have thought about this attempt to reclaim her? What would the free black population of Philadelphia or Portsmouth have thought about this attempt to reclaim her? What would abolitionists, and although it's very early, we're not really sort of using that term in the late 18th century so much, what would those who have already started to dismantle the process of slavery think about these letters written by Washington? So that's an example. Another example might be to read a city directory. A directory, of course, would list the names of the head of household for most homes. And of course, that leaves women's names often deleted or omitted from records. But what I can do is follow the name of a father or husband, and that helps to situate the woman, in particular, own a judge, where she lived, who her husband was, how they lived, how many people were living in their household. Those are the ways that you have to look at documents that don't specifically cite or note the person that you're studying. And for those of us who do women's history and African-American history, this is absolutely crucial and important. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question 
about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Ona Judge had not run away? What do you think her life would have been like as Eliza Custis Law's slave? Hmm. All these kinds of questions are always difficult. But what my gut tells me, and of course this is all just speculative, my gut tells me that she would have gone to work for Eliza and that she would have been sort of doomed to poor treatment. I'm not certain, and for those who've read Never Caught or who will read Never Caught, you'll understand that someone else is sent to work for Eliza once Ona runs away, and that person is actually able to find freedom by working for Eliza. But that situation, those circumstances were unique, and I think for Ona, it would have given her the opportunity to leave Virginia. She would have ended up in the new federal city in Washington. And perhaps she would have had an opportunity to eventually free herself. But, you know, I'm hesitant to say that. And I think that what we do know is that the choice that she made to run away was really the only choice she felt like she had in 1796. And so, you know, it's hard for me to speculate whether or not she would have stayed enslaved or become free. But we do know, the one thing we know for certain is that her life would have changed dramatically. Erica. Now that you've investigated and told Ona's story, what are you researching and writing about now? <laughs> I've got actually, I've got a couple of projects that I'm working on and I've been so busy with Ona. It's a little funny, but it's also nice to think about the next set of projects. What I'll say, I'm working on one project that focuses more on the enslaved in Virginia. And I'll be somewhat discreet with my descriptions right now, but I have another project that is focusing more on the lives of enslaved women in New England, all, of course, sort of in the early America period. So I'll be secretive, but I promise that the next book won't disappoint. Intriguing. And if we have more questions about Ona Judge, where should we look for more information about how we can contact you? I always welcome questions and comments and thoughts, and I've been so very happy to receive so many since the book was first published. I think the best way to get in contact with me is through my website, which is ericaarmstrongdunbar.com. So all one word, ericaarmstrongdunbar.com. And there's a section where you can reach out to me, and I'm happy to answer questions or to engage in conversation. And so I welcome the comments and the questions. Erica Dunbar, thank you for taking the time to share the life of Ona Judge with us. She really was a remarkable woman. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you for doing such great work with the show. What does the story of the founding of the United States look like when we tell it through the eyes of the enslaved? This was a question that Erica sought to answer by exploring the life of Ona Judge, an enslaved woman who served the Washingtons in their roles as president and first lady. And what Erica found from Ona's story is that early Americans really struggled with the practice of slavery. During the 1780s and 1790s, Northern states both abolished slavery outright and passed gradual emancipation laws that prescribed the end of slavery over a period of time. At the same time, Southern states worked to entrench and protect the institution. And Ona Judge witnessed all of these actions from right inside the presidential mansion. Now, during her time in the capital cities of New York and Philadelphia, Ona witnessed social debates over slavery and watched free black populations grow in the North. As Erica noted, Witnessing such change must have been both exciting and frustrating for both Ona and the Washingtons. And we can see this frustration in the Washington slave rotation scheme. Every six months, the Washingtons rotated their nine slaves out of Pennsylvania, taking them home to Mount Vernon or across the Delaware River to New Jersey, all in an effort to thwart the provisions of Pennsylvania's 1780 Gradual Emancipation Law. Now, as Erica noted, At no time did the Washingtons break Pennsylvania's law by rotating their slaves in and out of the Commonwealth. But we can see Erica's point that the Washington scheme did violate the spirit of the law, which leads us to the idea of the benevolent slaveholder. Was there ever such a thing as a benevolent slaveholder? 
Many books have portrayed the Washingtons as benevolent slaveholders, slave owners who treated their slaves fairly and humanely. However, as our discussion with Erica revealed, the Washingtons, George in particular, actively monitored and corrected the behavior of their slaves. They ordered physical corrections like whippings and beatings and sold recalcitrant or troublesome slaves to the Caribbean. Even if some contemporary historical sources report the Washingtons as benevolent slaveholders, why is it that so many of their slaves attempted to run away from their control? And as we just discovered, the life of Ona Judge shows us exactly the life a fugitive slave could expect, one of hard menial work, a precarious existence where every day seemed to be a struggle just to make enough money to buy food and pay rent, and a life filled with fear, a life where you're always wondering and always fearing that you'll be caught by your owner and returned to slavery. And yet, fugitive slaves like Ona Judge made this type of life work and noted that they preferred this tough, uncertain life to life as slaves. You can find more information about Erica, her book Never Caught, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 137. The Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture is a proud citizen of vast early America. They demonstrate their support of the vast world of early American history, not only by supporting Ben Franklin's world, but also by publishing the William & Mary Quarterly, the leading journal of early American history since 1943. To learn more about the William & Mary Quarterly and how you can enjoy some of the best scholarship on the vast world of early American history, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash WMQ. Finally, what do you think about the life of Ona Judge? If you were in her position, do you think you would have left the Washington's household and embraced the life of a fugitive slave? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. <laughs>